Chapter 3. Mental Transmutation Mind, as well as metals and elements, may be transmuted from state to state, degree to degree, condition to condition, pole to pole, vibration to vibration. True hermetic transmutation is a mental art. The Cabalion As we have stated, the Hermetists were the original alchemists, astrologers, and psychologists, Hermes having been the founder of these schools of thought. From astrology has grown modern astronomy. From alchemy has grown modern chemistry. From the mystic psychology has grown the modern psychology of the schools. But it must not be supposed that the ancients were ignorant of that which the modern schools supposed to be their exclusive and special property. The records engraved on the stones of ancient Egypt show conclusively that the ancients had a full comprehensive knowledge of astronomy, the very building of the pyramids showing the connection between their design and the study of astronomical science. Nor were they ignorant of chemistry, for the fragments of the ancient writings show that they were acquainted with the chemical properties of things. In fact, the ancient theories regarding physics are being slowly verified by the latest discoveries of modern science, notably those relating to the constitution of matter. Nor must it be supposed that they were ignorant of the so-called modern discoveries in psychology. On the contrary, the Egyptians were especially skilled in the science of psychology, particularly in the branches that the modern schools ignore, but which, nevertheless, are being uncovered under the name of psychic science, which is perplexing the psychologists of today, and making them reluctantly admit that there may be something in it after all. The truth is that beneath the material chemistry, astronomy, and psychology, that is, the psychology in its phase of brain action, the ancients possessed a knowledge of transcendental astronomy, called astrology, of transcendental chemistry, called alchemy, of transcendental psychology, called mystic psychology. They possessed the inner knowledge as well as the outer knowledge, the latter alone being possessed by modern scientists. Among the many secret branches of knowledge possessed by the Hermetists, was that known as mental transmutation, which forms the subject matter of this lesson. Transmutation is a term usually employed to designate the agent art of the transmutation of metals, particularly of the base metals into gold. The word transmute means to change from one nature, form, or substance into another, to transform. Webster. And accordingly, mental transmutation means the art of changing and transforming mental states forms, and conditions into others. So you may see that mental transmutation is the art of mental chemistry, if you like the term, a form of practical mystic psychology. But this means far more than appears on the surface. Transmutation, alchemy, or chemistry on the mental plane is important enough in its effects, to be sure, and if the art stopped there, it would still be one of the most important branches of study known to man. But this is only the beginning. Let us see why. The first of the seven hermetic principles is the principle of mentalism, the axiom of which is, the all is mind, the universe is mental, which means that the underlying reality of the universe is mind, and the universe itself is mental, that is, existing in the mind of the all. We shall consider this principle in succeeding lessons, but let us see the effect of the principle if it be assumed to be true. If the universe is mental in its nature, then mental transmutation must be the art of changing the conditions of the universe, along the lines of matter, force, and mind. So you see, therefore, that mental transmutation is really the magic of which the ancient writers had so much to say in their mystical works, and about which they gave so few practical instructions. If all be mental, then the art which enables one to transmute mental conditions must render the master the controller of material conditions, as well as those ordinarily called mental. As a matter of fact, none but advanced mental alchemists have been able to attain the degree of power necessary to control the grosser physical conditions, such as the control of the elements of nature, the production or cessation of tempests, the production and cessation of earthquakes, and other great physical phenomena. But that such men have existed, and do exist today, is a matter of earnest belief to all advanced occultists of all schools, that the masters exist and have these powers, the best teachers assure their students, having had experiences which justify them in such belief and statements. 
These masters do not make public exhibitions of their powers, but seek seclusion from the crowds of men in order to better work their way along the path of attainment. We mention their existence at this point merely to call your attention to the fact that their power is entirely mental and operates along the lines of the higher mental transmutation under the hermetic principle of mentalism. The universe is mental, the Kabbalion. But students and hermetists of lesser degree than masters, the initiates and teachers, are able to freely work along the mental plane in mental transmutation. In fact, all that we call psychic phenomena, mental influence, mental science, new thought phenomena, etc., operates along the same general lines, for there is but one principle involved, no matter by what name the phenomena be called. The student and practitioner of mental transmutation works among the mental plane, transmuting mental conditions, states, etc., into others, according to various formulas, more or less efficacious. The various treatments, affirmations, denials, etc., of the schools of mental science are but formulas, often quite imperfect and unscientific, of the hermetic art. The majority of modern practitioners are quite ignorant compared to the ancient masters, for they lack the fundamental knowledge upon which the work is based. Not only may the mental states, etc., of oneself be changed or transmuted by hermetic methods, but also the states of others may be, and are, constantly transmuted in the same way, usually unconsciously, but often consciously by some understanding the laws and principles, in cases where the people affected are not informed of the principles of self-protection. And more than this, as many students and practitioners of modern mental science know, Every material condition depending upon the minds of other people may be changed or transmuted in accordance with the earnest desire, will, and treatments of a person desiring changed conditions of life. The public are so generally informed regarding these things at present that we do not deem it necessary to mention the same at length, our purpose at this point being merely to show the hermetic principle and art underlying all of these various forms of practice, good and evil, for the force can be used in opposite directions, according to the hermetic principles of polarity. In this little book we shall state the basic principles of mental transmutation, that all who read may grasp the underlying principles, and thus possess the master key that will unlock the many doors of the principle of polarity. We shall now proceed to a consideration of the first of the hermetic seven principles, the principle of mentalism, in which is explained the truth that the all is mind, the universe is mental, in the words of the Kabbalion. We ask the close attention and careful study of this great principle on the part of our students, for it is really the basic principle of the whole hermetic philosophy and of the hermetic art of mental transmutation. Chapter 4. The All Under and back of, the universe of time, space, and change is ever to be found the substantial reality, the fundamental truth. The Kabbalion. Substance means that which underlies all outward manifestations, the essence, the essential reality, the thing in itself, etc. Substantial means actually existing, being the essential element, being real, etc. Reality means the state of being real, true, enduring, valid, fixed, permanent, actual, etc. Under and behind all outward appearances or manifestations, there must always be a substantial reality. This is the law. Man, considering the universe, of which he is a unit, sees nothing but change in matter, forces, and mental states. He sees that nothing really is, but that everything is becoming and changing. Nothing stands still. Everything is being born, growing, dying. The very instant a thing reaches its height, it begins to decline. The law of rhythm is in constant operation. There is no reality, enduring quality, fixity, or substantiality in anything. Nothing is permanent but change. He sees all things evolving from other things and resolving into other things. Constant action and reaction, inflow and outflow, building up and tearing down, creation and destruction, birth, growth, and death. Nothing endures but change. And if he be a thinking man, he realizes that all of these changing things must be but outward appearances or manifestations of some underlying power, some substantial reality. All thinkers in all lands and in all times have assumed the necessity for postulating the existence of this substantial reality. 
All philosophies worthy of the name have been based upon this thought. Men have given to this substantial reality many names. Some have called it by the term of deity, under many titles. Others have called it the infinite and eternal energy. Others have tried to call it matter. But all have acknowledged its existence. It is self-evident. It needs no argument. In these lessons, we have followed the example of some of the world's greatest thinkers, both ancient and modern, the Hermetic Masters, and have called this underlying power this substantial reality. By the Hermetic name of the All, which term we consider the most comprehensive of the many terms applied by man to that which transcends names and terms, we accept and teach the view of the great Hermetic thinkers of all times, as well as of those illumined souls who have reached higher planes of being, both of whom assert that the inner nature of the all is unknowable. This must be so, for naught by the all itself can comprehend its own nature and being. The Hermetists believe and teach that the all, in itself, is and must ever be unknowable. They regard all the theories, guesses, and speculations of the theologians and metaphysicians regarding the inner nature of the all as but the childish efforts of mortal minds to grasp the secret of the infinite. Such efforts have always failed and will always fail, from the very nature of the task. One pursuing such inquiries travels around and around in a labyrinth of thought, until he is lost to all sane reasoning, action, or conduct, and is utterly unfitted for the work of life. He is like the squirrel which frantically runs around and around the circling treadmill wheel of his cage, traveling ever and yet reaching nowhere, at the end a prisoner still, and standing just where he started. And still more presumptuous are those who attempt to ascribe to the all the personality, qualities, properties, characteristics, and attributes of themselves, ascribing to the all the human emotions, feelings, and characteristics, even down to the pettiest qualities of mankind, such as jealousy, susceptibility to flattery and praise, desire for offerings and worship, and all the other survivals from the days of the childhood of the race. Such ideas are not worthy of grown men and women, and are rapidly being discarded. At this point, it may be proper for me to state that we make a distinction between religion and theology, between philosophy and metaphysics. Religion to us means that intuitional realization of the existence of the all, and one's relationship to it, while theology means the attempts of men to ascribe personality, qualities, and characteristics to it. Their theories regarding its affairs, will, desires, plans, and designs, and their assumption of the office of middlemen between the all and the people. Philosophy to us means the inquiry after knowledge of things knowable and thinkable, while metaphysics means the attempt to carry the inquiry over and beyond the boundaries and into regions unknowable and unthinkable, and with the same tendency as that of theology. And, consequently, both religion and philosophy mean to us things having roots in reality, while theology and metaphysics seem like broken reeds rooted in the quicksands of ignorance, and affording naught but the most insecure support for the mind or soul of man. We do not insist upon our students accepting these definitions. We mention them merely to show our position. At any rate, you shall hear very little about theology and metaphysics in these lessons. But while the essential nature of the all is unknowable, there are certain truths connected with its existence, which the human mind finds itself compelled to accept, and an examination of these reports form a proper subject of inquiry, particularly as they agree with the reports of the illumined on higher planes. And to this inquiry we now invite you. That which is the fundamental truth, the substantial reality, is beyond true meaning, but the wise men call it the all. The Cabalion. In its essence, the all is unknowable. The Cabalion. But the report of reason must be hospitably received and treated with respect. The Cabalion. The human reason, whose reports we must accept so long as we think at all, informs us as follows regarding the all, and that without attempting to remove the veil of the unknowable. 1. The all must be all that really is. There can be nothing existing outside of the all, else the all would not be the all. 2. The all must be infinite, for there is nothing else to define, confine, bound, limit, or restrict the all. It must be infinite in time, or eternal. It must have always continuously existed, for there is nothing else to have ever created it, and something can never evolve from nothing. 
and if it had ever not been even for a moment, it would not be now. It must continuously exist forever, for there is nothing to destroy it. And it can never not be, even for a moment, because something can never become nothing. It must be infinite in space. It must be everywhere, for there is no place outside of the all. It cannot be otherwise than continuous in space, without break, cessation, separation, or interruption, for there is nothing to break, separate, or interrupt its continuity, and nothing with which to fill in the gaps. It must be infinite in power or absolute, for there is nothing to limit, restrict, restrain, confine, disturb, or condition it. It is subject to no other power, for there is no other power. 3. The all must be immutable, or not subject to change in its real nature, for there is nothing to work changes upon it, nothing into which it could change, nor from which it could have changed. It cannot be added to nor subtracted from, increased nor diminished, nor become greater or lesser in any respect whatsoever. It must have always been, and must always remain, just what it is now, the all. There has never been, is not now, and never will be, anything else into which it can change. The all being infinite, absolute, eternal, and unchangeable, it must follow that anything finite, changeable, fleeting, and conditioned cannot be the all. And as there is nothing outside of the all, in reality, then any and all such finite things must be as nothing in reality. Now do not become befogged nor frightened. We are not trying to lead you into the Christian science field under cover of hermetic philosophy. There is a reconciliation of this apparently contradictory state of affairs. Be patient. We will reach it in time. We see around us that which is called matter, which forms the physical foundation for all forms. Is the all merely matter? Not at all. Matter cannot manifest life or mind. And as life and mind are manifested in the universe, the all cannot be matter, for nothing rises higher than its own source. Nothing is ever manifested in an effect that is not in the cause. Nothing is evolved as a consequent that is not involved as an antecedent. And then modern science informs us that there is really no such thing as matter, that what we call matter is merely interrupted energy or force, that is, energy or force at a low rate of vibration. As a recent writer has said, matter has melted into mystery. Even material science has abandoned the theory of matter and now rests on the basis of energy. Then is the all mere energy or force? Not energy or force, as the materialists use the terms, for their energy and force are blind, mechanical things, devoid of life or mind. Life and mind can never evolve from blind energy or force, for the reasons given a moment ago. Nothing can rise higher than its source. Nothing is evolved unless it is involved. Nothing manifests in the effect unless it is in the cause. And so the all cannot be mere energy or force, for, if it were, then there would be no such things as life and mind in existence. And we know better than that, for we are alive and using mind to consider this very question. And so are those who claim that energy or force is everything. What is there then higher than matter or energy that we know to be existent in the universe? Life and mind. Life and mind in all their varying degrees of unfoldment. Then, you ask, do you mean to tell us that the all is life and mind? Yes, and no, is our answer. If you mean life and mind as we poor, petty mortals know them, we say no, the all is not that. But what kind of life and mind do you mean, you ask? The answer is living mind. As far above that which mortals know by those words, as life and mind are higher than mechanical forces or matter, infinite living mind as compared to finite life and mind. We mean that which the illumined souls mean when they reverently pronounce the word spirit. The all is infinite living mind. The illumined call it spirit. Chapter 5. The Mental Universe The universe is mental, held in the mind of the all. The Kabbalion. The all is spirit. But what is spirit? This question cannot be answered for the reason that its definition is practically that of the all, which cannot be explained or defined. Spirit is simply a name that men give to the highest conception of infinite living mind. It means the real essence. It means living mind, as much superior to life and mind as we know them, 
as the latter are superior to mechanical energy and matter. Spirit transcends our understanding, and we use the term merely that we may think or speak of the all. For the purposes of thought and understanding, we are justified in thinking of spirit as infinite living mind, at the same time acknowledging that we cannot fully understand it. We must either do this or stop thinking of the matter at all. Let us now proceed to a consideration of the nature of the universe, as a whole and in its parts. What is the universe? We have seen that there can be nothing outside of the all. Then is the universe the all? No, this cannot be, because the universe seems to be made up of many and is constantly changing. And in other ways, it does not measure up to the ideas that we are compelled to accept regarding the all, as stated in our last lesson. Then if the universe be not the all, then it must be nothing. Such is the inevitable conclusion of the mind at first thought. But this will not satisfy the question, for we are sensible of the existence of the universe. Then if the universe is neither the all nor nothing, what can it be? Let us examine this question. If the universe exists at all, or seems to exist, it must proceed in some way from the all. It must be a creation of the all. But as something can never come from nothing, from what could the all have created it? Some philosophers have answered this question by saying that the all created the universe from itself, that is, from the being and substance of the all. But this will not do, for the all cannot be subtracted from, nor divided, as we have seen. And then again, if this be so, would not each particle in the universe be aware of its being the all? The all could not lose its knowledge of itself, nor actually become an atom, or blind force, or lowly living thing. Some men, indeed, realizing that the all is indeed all, and also recognizing that they, the men, existed, have jumped to the conclusion that they and the all were identical, and they have filled the air with shouts of, I am God, to the amusement of the multitude and the sorrow of sages. The claim that the corpuscle, that I am man, would be modest in comparison. But what indeed is the universe? if it be not the all, not yet created by the all, having separated itself into fragments? What else can it be? Of what else can it be made? This is the great question. Let us examine it carefully. We find here that the principle of correspondence, see lesson one, comes to our aid here. The old hermetic axiom, as above so below, may be pressed into service at this point. Let us endeavor to get a glimpse of the workings on higher planes, by examining those on our own. The principle of correspondence must apply to this as well as to other problems. Let us see. On his own plane of being, how does man create? Well, first he may create by making something out of outside materials. But this will not do. For there are no materials outside of the all with which it may create. Well, then secondly, man procreates or reproduces his kind by the process of begetting which is self-multiplication accomplished by transferring a portion of his substance to his offspring. But this will not do, because the all cannot transfer or subtract a portion of itself, nor can it reproduce or multiply itself. In the first place, there would be a taking away, and in the second case, a multiplication or addition to the all, both thoughts being an absurdity. Is there no third way in which man creates? Yes, there is. He creates mentally. And in so doing, he uses no outside materials, nor does he reproduce himself, and yet his spirit pervades the mental creation. Following the principle of correspondence, we are justified in considering that the all creates the universe mentally, in a manner akin to the process whereby man creates mental images. And here is where the report of reason tallies precisely with the report of the illumined, as shown by their teachings and writings. Such are the teachings of the wise men. Such was the teaching of Hermes. The all can create in no other way except mentally, without either using material, and there is none to use, or else reproducing itself, which is also impossible. There is no escape from this conclusion of the reason which, as we have said, agrees with the highest teachings of the illumined. Just as you, student, may create a universe of your own in your mentality, so does the all create universes in its own mentality but your universe is the mental creation of a finite mind, whereas that of the all is the creation of an infinite. The two are similar in kind, but infinitely different in degree, 
We shall examine more closely into the process of creation and manifestation as we proceed. But this is the point to fix in your minds at this stage. The universe, and all it contains, is a mental creation of the all. Verily indeed, all is mind. The all creates in its infinite mind countless universes, which exist for eons of time, and yet, to the all, the creation, development, decline, and death of a million universes is as the time of the twinkling of an eye. The Cabalion. The infinite mind of the all is the womb of the universes. The Cabalion. The principle of gender, see Lesson 1 and other lessons to follow, is manifested on all planes of life, material, mental, and spiritual. But, as we have said before, gender does not mean sex. Sex is merely a material manifestation of gender. Gender means relating to generation or creation. And whenever anything is generated or created on any plane, the principle of gender must be manifested. And this is true even in the creation of universes. Now, do not jump to the conclusion that we are teaching that there is a male and female god or creator. That idea is merely a distortion of the ancient teachings on the subject. The true teaching is that the all in itself is above gender, as it is above every other law, including those of time and space. It is the law from which the laws proceed, and is not subject to them. But when the all manifests on the plane of generation or creation, then it acts according to law and principle for it is moving on a lower plane of being, and consequently it manifests the principle of gender in its masculine and feminine aspects on the mental plane, of course. This idea may seem startling to some of you who hear it for the first time, but you have all really passively accepted it in your everyday conceptions. You speak of the fatherhood of God and the motherhood of nature, of God, the Divine Father, and nature, the Universal Mother, and have thus instinctively acknowledged the principle of gender in the universe. Is this not so? But the hermetic teaching does not imply a real duality. The all is one. The two aspects are merely aspects of manifestation. The teaching is that the masculine principle manifested by the all stands, in a way, apart from the actual mental creation of the universe. It projects its will toward the feminine principle, which may be called nature, whereupon the latter begins the actual work of the evolution of the universe, from simple centers of activity onto man, and then on and on still higher, all according to well-established and firmly enforced laws of nature. If you prefer the old figures of thought, you may think of the masculine principle as God, the Father, and of the feminine principle as nature, the universal mother, from whose womb all things have been born. This is more than a mere poetic figure of speech. It is an idea of the actual process of the creation of the universe. But always remember that the all is but one, and that in its infinite mind the universe is generated, created, and exists. It may help you to get the proper idea if you apply the law of correspondence to yourself and your own mind. You know that the part of you which you call I, in a sense, stands apart and witnesses the creation of mental images in your own mind. The part of your mind in which the mental generation is accomplished may be called the me, in distinction from the I, which stands apart and witnesses and examines the thoughts, ideas, and images of the me. As above, so below. Remember, and the phenomena of one plane may be employed to solve the riddles of higher or lower planes. Is it any wonder that you, the child, feel that instinctive reference for the all, which feeling we call religion, that respect and reverence for the father mind? Is it any wonder that, when you consider the works and wonders of nature, you are overcome with a mighty feeling which has its roots away down in your inmost being? It is the mother mind that you are pressing close up to, like a babe to the breast. Do not make the mistake of supposing that the little world you see around you, the earth, which is a mere grain of dust in the universe, is the universe itself. There are millions upon millions of such worlds and greater. And there are millions of millions of such universes in existence, within the infinite mind of the all. And even in our own little solar system there are regions and planes of life far higher than ours, and beings compared to which we earthbound mortals are as the slimy life-forms that dwell on the ocean's bed when compared to man. There are beings with powers and attributes higher than man has ever dreamed of the gods possessing, and yet these beings were once as you, and still lower, and you will be even as they, and still higher in time, 
for such is the destiny of man as reported by the illumined. And death is not real, even in the relative sense. It is but birth to a new life, and you shall go on and on and on to higher and still higher planes of life, for eons upon eons of time. The universe is your home, and you shall explore its farthest recesses before the end of time. You are dwelling in the infinite mind of the all, and your possibilities and opportunities are infinite, both in time and space. And at the end of the grand cycle of eons, when the all shall draw back into itself all of its creations, you will go gladly, for you will then be able to know the whole truth of being at one with the all. Such is the report of the illumined, those who have advanced well along the path. And in the meantime, rest calm and serene. You are safe and protected by the infinite power of the Father-Mother Mind. Within the Father-Mother Mind, mortal children are at home. The Gabalion. There is not one who is fatherless nor motherless in the universe. The Cabalion. Chapter 6. The Divine Paradox. The half-wise, recognizing the comparative unreality of the universe, imagine that they may defy its laws. Such are vain and presumptuous fools, and they are broken against the rocks and torn asunder by the elements by reason of their folly. The truly wise, knowing the nature of the universe, use law against laws, the higher against the lower, and by the art of alchemy transmute that which is undesirable into that which is worthy, and thus triumph. Mastery consists not in abnormal dreams, visions, and fantastic imaginings or living, but in using the higher forces against the lower, escaping the pains of the lower planes by vibrating on the higher. Transmutation, not presumptuous denial, is the weapon of the master.